Okay, um, yeah, so I guess some of you, um, maybe not all, but most of you will have read my, my abstract. And um, I will, um, I'm, as a phenomenologist, I actually also work on theories of space and place and how those are appropriated. So, and I will jump right, right into it. So, um, in his book, Gesture and Speech, uh, André Laura Gouin points out that the human act par excellence may not so much be the creation of tools, but rather the domestication of time and space. That is the creation of a human time and a human space. In my talk, I want to focus on this creation, which becomes possible through the entanglement of body, place and time. In short, I will call this entanglement the phenomenological complex. That's just a technical term now for my talk. And I will show how this complex lies at the core of archaeology. Um, just let me go to the, which brings me now to the first part. As most of us has, have experienced, the self is fundamentally entwined with place. The human subject is always oriented and situated in a place. Therefore, Edward Casey calls it the geographical subject. The primary way in which the geographical subject realizes its active commitment to place is by means of habitation. Habitation here includes nomadic life as well as settled dwelling. It is the manner in which we relate to places we inhabit by means of concerted bodily movements. According to Maurice merlin ponty lift body movement is the pivotal element in understanding the body-place relationship because our body is not in space or in time, but inhabits space and time. Movement reveals a more fundamental form of intentionality, that is, the, uh, the, the way we refer to the world. So intentionality is a rather technical term in uh, phenomenology. Uh, it means how we refer to, to the world. It doesn't have anything to do with our intentions. Uh, no, not least, not necessarily. Melon ponty understands motility as basic intentionality, as, as he calls it, motor intentionality. This kind of intentionality is at the same time an orientation towards the intersensory unit of a world. Movement, he writes, is not thought about movement, and bodily space is not space thought of or represented each voluntary movement takes place in a setting against the background, which is determined by the movement itself. We perform our movements in a space which is not empty or unrelated to them, but which, on the contrary, bears a highly determinate relation to them. Movement and background are, in fact, only artificially separated <laughs> stages of a unique totality." End quote. Through bodily movement, space gains infinite meaning and significance. To make this clearer, consider the following example. Imagine you walk to your workplace every, uh, every day. After a while, walking to your workplace becomes a habit. That means you no longer need to pay attention to your surroundings to find your way to work and back home. You can even daydream because your body knows the surroundings. Unlike a lot of typical habits in which we move only parts of our body, like all kinds of nervous tics, or our abilities like riding a bike, the walk to, to the workplace includes your direct environment. That is, the background belongs essentially to movement. As far as bodily space is concerned, it is clear that there is a knowledge of place that coexists with that place. But this knowledge cannot be simply converted into description. This knowledge is 
what I call memory of place. To move in space is the body's, body's way of getting acquainted with space and thereby create place. In the acquaintance of a place, we incorporate it into our bodily space. Those modes of acquaintance of space incarnation, Melon Ponty calls habits. Habit is a particular knowledge of our lived body. It is the knowledge in the hands, he writes, which is forthcoming only when bodily effort is made and cannot be formulated in detachment from that effort." End quote. The decisive point here is that it is the lived body, the flesh, which links the self to lived place and thus establishes an intimate relationship with our environment. That means we always experience place through what also Casey calls environmental embodiment. Casey distinguishes two ways in which the body works as a link, referred to as outgoing and incoming. The lived body encounters the place world in going out to meet it. We don't just live in a world, we live in a place world. That is, place is the way in which world becomes concrete to us. It is, you could say, the texture of the world. It is the body itself, as Casey emphasizes, that establishes the felt directionality, the sense of level and the experienced distance and depth that together constitute the main structural features of any given place in which we find ourselves and which we remember." End quote. Just think of the three inherent axes of the body, like up, down, front, back, right, left, through which the primary dimensions and the implicit directionality of a place is, are implemented. But although the body introduces a subjective coordinate system, one must not make the mistake to confuse place and space. Space is the encompassing volumetric void in which things are positioned. Place, on the other hand, is the immediate environment of my lived body. The body, in giving us spatial orientation, interacts with place, is affected by it, feels it, and through that action, creates it. But in this creation, the place also influences the body. This leads us to the incoming way. The body bears the traces of those places it inhabited. These traces, uh, Casey writes, are continually laid down in the body, sedimenting themselves there and thus becoming formative of its specific somatography, the inscribing of geography into the body, a body is shaped by the places it has come to know and that have come to it, come to take up residence in it by a special kind of placial incorporation." End quote. This relationship is reciprocal. Places influence and alter us as much as they are altered by our, by our having been in them. Ultimately, what gives place this power is their mere presence and how it felt to be in that presence. Which brings me now to the second part of my talk. So, in the way that a place becomes a bodily part of us, the time we lived at that place becomes a bodily part of us as well. We appropriate space and time at once through our bodies and their movement. Now, interestingly, it is also through places that we gain an understanding of time. In phenomenology, we distinguish between subjective time, which describes the conscious experience of time as duration, and objective time, which appears as observable change in the world. So we can speak of durational time and cosmological time, as I call them. For both, the entanglement with place plays an important role. The felt experience of time 
gains its power inasmuch as time materializes itself in place. The two most prominent factors here are movement and stasis. As Dylan Trick describes it, um, begin quote, moving in place, be it from the car park to the elevator or from one planet to another, we experience time in and through place. Moving through place means tracing an arc of time. For this reason, the felt temporal experience of a given day is inextric inextricably bound with the movements of the body, such that the same day diminish or expand in time according to the level of spatial activity." End quote. In addition, Moving in an unfamiliar place seems to expand our experience of time, whereas moving in familiar, even habitual places, uh, uh, um, seems to the, the moving in habitual places, seem to swallow up time, desensitizes us to the passage of time, and at the end of the day or the year, we wonder where the time has gone. <coughs> One of the first and primal ways how cosmological time appears to us is through natural rhythms. There are natural rhythms directly connected to the body, like hunger and sleep cycles, the beat of our heart, the pace of our steps, <coughs> and those which only appear because of places like the alternation of day and night, the movement of the stars at the night sky, or the change of seasons. Again, the body and its relation to place play a crucial role. As bodies align, Trick writes, with the movement of the earth, so the temporality of the day becomes more an unfolding process, understandable in objective terms. Instead, the temporal distance of the day dwells in our bodies. From the light of morning to the darkness of night, and then during the blackness of sleep, our bodies become the vehicle for the reality of the Earth's movement." End quote. That means that our body also becomes the vehicle for cosmological time. Which now brings me to the third part, the connection with archaeology. In conclusion, there are two main ways of how time materializes, which are also of significance for archaeology. First, time plays an indirect role in creating places. It is only through the movement of our lived body that we create places and over time create home places. In the way we become part of a topograph topographic wholeness, we also develop a memory of place. So in appropriating space in form of places, we also appropriate time in a rather unconscious and bodily way. Second, in creating places, we are then able to pay attention to natural rhythms, which are our first encounter with cos cosmological time, that is the appearance of time in the world. These rhythms structure our everyday lives and thus become part of the structures of our home places and therefore are also important for understanding the lives of humans in the past. The knowledge of the phenomenological complex is the basis for archaeological work. Inasmuch as we share the same condi conditions as humans, we are able to reconstruct the lives of those who lived before us based on the reciprocal relationship we have with places all the time. At the basis of archaeology lies the work at excavation sites, the uncovering of traces and the reconstructing of past lives at those places. Archaeology then can be understood as the reappropriation of time through the work at and with places. It is a common misunderstanding to think of memory as a means of conservation of the past, like a videotape, for example. But rather, memory is our ability to experience and create continuity between the past and the present. So 
So memory describes the existence of the past in the present. And it is by the means of the phenomenological complex that archaeologists in their work can endow continuity and thus become fundamental for our history as human beings. Thank you. Thank you.